Well, hey, good afternoon. Thanks for sitting around for the tail end of the presentation. So I'm G. Mark Hardy. I want to talk about blockchain, kind of the new digital Swiss Army knife. Now, as I put this together, I was talking to folks, people still want to understand a little bit more about kind of the currency aspect about it. So I will be talking somewhat of it. But in a way, when you get into blockchain and the first use of it, it was for, well, money. And if you take a look at the history of money, you start out with things like barter. The problem is, if I have a cow and you have chickens and I need a chicken, how do I make change? You know, you can't like, you know, here you go. Here. Now I got a three-legged cow waiting to just go ahead and spend the rest of it. So you had a little bit of a problem with that. And as we moved on to things like shells and bronze and silver and gold and uh, finally, the gold standard, but by 2009, a new idea came about, something called Bitcoin. But here's an interesting question for you. How much money have you got? Now, don't tell me, I mean, it's not my business. This is a question you're going to ask yourself. How much money do you have? And if you think about it, if it's not in your pocket, where is it? Oh, yeah, well, it's in the bank. Really? They have a pile of coins and bills with your name on it, sitting in like a little special safe deposit. But no, they don't. You have a ledger entry in a computer system that we trust they are not going to screw it up. And if they did screw it up, and then who's going to argue with the bank and win? It's going to be very, very difficult. In fact, what you find out is that the majority of money, over 90% of it, really only exists as a ledger entry somewhere. You've got to trust in that whole system. And for example, we were talking earlier about Cyprus. A couple of years ago, they had a uh, sort of a big haircut for some of the banks. What happened, if you're not familiar with it, is that banks could not meet their depository requirements. The government, the regulator said, you're going to be insolvent. You have to put up the cash. Well, they didn't have the cash. That was why they're in trouble. So they took a look at the insurance level for individual depositors, about 100,000 euros each. And if you had less than that, you got untouched. If you had 105,000 euros, you took a haircut to 100. What if you had 200,000 euros? Down to 100. 8 million, because you're a business or it's down to 100. Yeah, all of a sudden, overnight, bam. And so that got people thinking about, you know, to whom do you trust out here? I mean, gold is tangible. You can look at it, it's pretty, it's shiny. You gotta lug it around a little bit and it gets quite heavy, but for the most part, we depended upon that. However, you look at the loss of the gold standard, the United States in the 1970s when Nixon talked us off of it, why was that? Well, because there was basically a run on the gold in the United States. People are saying, wow, I could redeem for gold based upon your official exchange rate. We'll do it. Well, after a while, they realized there's gonna be nothing left. So they said, okay, uh, time out guys, we're not gonna redeem for gold. We're going to go to a fiat currency, which is a Federal Reserve note. What you see in your pocket is a promise of the United States of America to make your money good. Well, then you go to any other place, whether it's a euro or Zimbabwe or the like, and they still have the same thing. Nobody backs their currency anymore on stuff. Other than perhaps Venezuela, which they kind of tried with uh, back in February, but we'll get to that. But this is money only because you believe it's money. Okay. If you and I stop believing in this, it doesn't work anymore. Because there's no place that you can go like the old days where I had a blue seal, $1 bill, silver certificate, take it to the bank, and they will give me equivalent amount of silver, basically four quarters. By the way, at today's silver price, how much is a quarter worth, like a 1964 quarter, if you melted it down in a lump? Wow, you're paying a lot for silver. It was about three fifty last time I checked. But... Uh, it's still a whole lot more than 25 cents, right? So you can see what's happened is had we stayed wedded to a metal exchange and the metal is much more desirable on the global market, everybody's going to be cashing the dollar bills for silver and the silver would all be gone. Well, let's take a look going forward. Why even bother with money? It gives us a store and forward of value. It allows me to, for example, dig a ditch for a man today and then tomorrow go out and buy a chicken from somebody else. What do I do with the value I created for person X to redeem it with some other value from person Y. So it can transform that into goods, into labor, and even into power, because if we go ahead and you look at the ISO model, we all know that layer eight is, of course, politics, and layer nine is money. So if you control layer nine, you can control the politics, and then you control the rest of the stack. All right. By the way, what's layer 10? Religion, yeah, you can't argue with that. But in any case, how much is money worth? So we take a look at Adam Smith, who back in 1776 wrote the real price of everything 
What it really costs is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. So for some people who work very hard to get something they want, other people care less about it, okay? So if you're into fashion and you want to go ahead and have, or jewelry or fancy computers or whatever it happens to be, you're going to work harder for it than someone who can care less about it. That ultimately is what sets the price. And when people stop caring about something, then it doesn't become worth as much anymore. Well, blockchain's now starting to hit the mainstream, at least in terms of communication. So you've even got slightly modified Dilbert. Sorry out there with my apologies to Scott Adams, but fair use claim because this is a non-pay you know, non presentation. You can do that, by the way. Uh, and so bosses want blockchain as one of the most talked about things for CEOs, CIOs in 2017, even though they have no freaking clue what it is. Uh, what color do you want that blockchain? And if you can, can spell the word blockchain or even sidechain, man, you're a consultant and people will pay you all kinds of money to utter great things. You see, what's happening is blockchain is to dot com as 19, you know, 2018 is to 1999. All right. It's just before the big one. It's going to be a big fall. There's some good stuff in there. That's where the hype is. Now, blockchain technology relative to dot com is about 1992. It's still really early on, and we're still working stuff out. There's going to be spectacular failures and busts and some really, really cool things. Now, dot-com didn't go bad for everybody. I mean, Amazon was down to, what, 10 bucks a share at some point. And a lot of other companies that kind of came out of there did really, really well. But the majority of the ones didn't. And you're going to have a huge shakeout of bad ideas, which is healthy, which means you want to go ahead and be on your toes and see what's going on. So for those who've heard about blockchain, what would you say is a two-word description of blockchain? Append only data structure. Digital list and that's only what well between the two of you, you got on average, you're you're good. Distributed ledger. We also think of a, a distributed ledger, but that does that mean it means no one person owns a master copy. I would respectfully suggest that with no one owning a master copy, the reason you do that is it's really federated mistrust. I don't have to trust the bank to keep my balance right. I don't have to trust a third party to ensure that my transactions are correct. What comes out of the whole thing, then, is that I can do business with somebody else whom I've never met and have no trustworthy intermediaries. Think about that. If I want to send money to somebody who's buying something at least on eBay and I want to send it over to France or India or some other nation, there's going to be all the exchange fees, the markups, the costs, the EFT is going to take a while, or a wire, or the SWIFT, and then all of a sudden we have a different way of doing it. So there's a huge amount of hype about it. People think blockchain could do all these things. Reality is I think we're going to find out it's a much narrower set of capabilities. So as we take a little more look under the covers, what's going on here? It goes all the way back to a paper that was published in 2008 under a pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. And I was quoting from the book of Satoshi, it's an electronic cash without going through a financial institution using a peer-to-peer -peer network on a hash-based proof-of-work, I'll explain that in a moment if you're not familiar with it, and the network itself requires minimal structure. Basically, no one owns it. It's not a centralized thing. It's kind of like, well, the internet. Who owns the internet? After Al Gore invented it, he kind of like gave it off to mankind. <laughs> And so what happens is we all kind of run different pieces of it, which is frustrating if you're a politician and you want to control it. Well, you really can't unless you're in North Korea, and then you do it pretty well because you only have a couple little access ports to your country. But I digress. So the question has been for a while, who is this Satoshi Nakamoto guy? I mean, if you look at the work that took place in the early couple of years, crypto mathematician, and you take a look, I remember Dan Kaminsky, when he first looked at Bitcoin, he said, you know, most things that involve crypto look pretty slick on the, at first, and you look at them and they're garbage. He said, this look like garbage until I look into it. The crypto is really pretty good. All right, so the crypto is pretty decent. Um, a C coder, because there's a lot of code that was written to get this thing off the ground. And someone would say a businessman. I've also heard people say maybe a con man. And that intersection of all that would then be Satoshi. Or some people have suggested, well, it was probably a team of people, and it's the intersection of all these. Who knows for sure? Well, there's some people who kind of come out of the woodwork saying, hey, I'm the inventor, and other people said, well, he is, or whatever. Well, we'll see. It Does it really matter at this point, though? I mean, it's up, and it's, it's off, and it's running. And you know, I've got my theories, but that's... Yeah, about 1.1 million of the first Bitcoins are still all tied up. Now, as soon as you move them, though, you give away your position. So that's kind of the problem. It's in German, they call it a Zugzwang in, in chess. It's your 
move, therefore you must lose, because there are no winning moves left. But we'll see how this all evolves. In any case, looking forward, as we find out that in this paper, it talks about the fact that we've relied upon third parties. Also think of the context, what happened in late 2008. U.S. government issued $700 billion of extra currency to bail out the banks. And when they asked in the Fed meeting, why $700 billion? They're like, well, it just sounded like a big number. I mean, that's it. It just sounded like a big number. There was really no way to correlate that to stuff. It was basically throwing a humongous amount of cash at the financial system to keep it from imploding. Because the lessons learned back in the early 90s is when Japan had a similar problem, what happened? They didn't intervene, and they went into almost a 26, now 27-year deflationary spiral. In Japan, things get a little bit cheaper every year. And so what's happened, now it's been an entire generation, and people think that way. Why would I buy a Toyota this year when next year it's going to be cheaper? Why would I go ahead and buy something when it's going to cost less? And so it's created an entire generation of non-spenders, living with your parents or, or using and use, you know, used cars, and you can't stimulate the economy. You know, Abeganomics was designed to do that, throw a whole bunch of money in there. They blew their balance sheets way out of whack. It still didn't quite work. So my opinion is the reason we did this back in 2008, at least the Fed, was what? It was like, okay, you're on the 50th floor of your building, first person shooter just walked in and they're starting to take everybody out. If you stand there, you shall die. If you jump out the open window, well, you got a little bit of time, right? Before that automatic stop catches up with you. And you never know, Superman or Iron Man might swoop by, you might invent something on the way down, you can boom, you get it. But at least you got a chance. So we're still falling and we're going, so far so good. So far, so good. <laughs> but I don't know where it's going to end up. So when you look at this whole thing here in the crypto, a lot of people, the, you know, sort of the pseudo-anarchists, well, you know, when everything else fails, it'll be back. I says, great, but who's going to be running the power plants if government collapses? Oh, anyway. <laughs> the problem with the whole model, though, is it has really only one critical flaw. If one person controls more than 50% of the vote, you lose. Why? It's a democracy. Now, what kind of government do we have in the United States? It's not a democracy, it's a republic. Because in a democracy, 51% of the population can vote the other 49% into slavery. All right, and that's the danger of a pure democracy. And so this was set up as a pure democracy, but the concern was if anybody actually got to the 50 percentile, they could saw off the branch that they're on and start cheating, but everybody would walk away and all the money you put into it, people would just say, hey, you just destroyed your own stuff. So it's sort of a balance of terror, kind of like nuclear weapons pointed at each other, but over on the blockchain. So what are we talking about with the term blockchain? A block is just simply going to be a set of transactions which are going to exist. And at the end of the block, when we go ahead and we post them, we're going to go ahead and take the public-private key pair. You should be familiar at least with that. And when you make a digital signature, you take your private key, public key, which one do I sign with? I take this packet, I hash it down, and then what? I encrypt the hash with my private key. I stick that at the end. My public key, anybody can read. So now, how do I prove that that was really me? You find my public key, you decrypt what was encrypted with the private key, there's a hash there. You recompute the hash, the hashes match, they didn't change. So now I can prove through a digital signature, not digitized, I'm not scanning an image, but a digital signature that that block is in fact not changed. Well, the next block, I'm going to go ahead and take the hash of the one before it and throw that into the hopper so that when this hash is out, it's linked to the one ahead of it and so on and so on and so on, which means that at any point in time, if I go back and try to rewrite history, I'd have to rewrite all of the hashes and the whole thing would come apart. And so the idea is you can't double spend because once it's spent, everybody can see it. The idea of a blockchain is there's no one authoritative copy. You can download it. It takes a few days, but you can download the whole Bitcoin blockchain or Bitcoin Cash or Monero. Pick whatever one you want and you can run it in your living room. All right? And you're not even mining anymore because for the most part, that's moved out of human space into, well, China, because they got all that electricity, but we'll come to that. If you agree upon a timestamp, you can sequence the blocks. We can now make sure that if I say I have money in my Bitcoin wallet, a Bitcoin wallet isn't a thing. Rather, it's simply a numeric address, base 58, if you really care, but what I can do if I say I'm going to give you a Bitcoin, if you're going to go ahead and give me a computer, you can go ahead and look at your copy of the blockchain and say, hmm, here's his address, all the pluses, all the minuses, all the minuses, all the plus. Yep, he's still got one Bitcoin in his wallet, that's address. I'll do the deal. 
And then you sit around and have a cup of coffee till it commits to the, the next block or two, and you go, okay, fine, we're good. It's not instantaneous, but it's a whole lot faster than like an ACH, which might take three days. The proof of work is kind of the magic to this idea. It brings up the issue of how do I know if I don't trust and you don't trust and nobody trusts, where do we trust? We trust the mathematics. So think of a proof of work like high school homework for the math teacher. When you had to go ahead and say, hey, you're going to do questions 1 through 9, 11, 12, 13a, and 15. And if you don't turn in your homework tomorrow, you don't pass the class. I hated doing stuff like that. Like, once I got it, I got it, okay? Like, we're, we're, we're hackers. We get this stuff. I do one, I'm done. But you didn't, you got to go do the proof of work. You have to demonstrate that you crank through all of the puzzles. So a proof of work here is basically talk about how do we go ahead and make these blocks locked down in a way using a hash. Well, a hash function is going to produce a fixed length output based upon a variable length input. If I have a SHA-256 hash, the SHA-256 algorithm is going to give me exactly 256 bits. Whether I have one bit in or I have the entire state of Nebraska going in, it's still going to come out at 256 bits. Well, a really good hash has the following principle. If I make the tiniest of changes to the input, I get all these cascading changes in the output. There's no such thing as close with a good hash function. It's not like a radio station, you kind of tune it. It's like a lottery that has only one prize. And if you don't nail it exactly right, you get nothing. There's no such thing as close in the hash world. Now, let's think about it from a probabilistic function. If I have 256 bits, what are the odds that my hash, if I compute it, it's going to begin with a zero versus a one? One and two, right? It's 50%. How about zero, zero? Well, one in four. Zero, zero, zero. Well, one in eight. Zero, 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 one in 16. Well, if I hash the same thing, I get the same result every single time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tweak or modify the input ever so slightly by throwing in something called a knots, a number used once. It's basically like a little bit of randomness into the input. It doesn't mean anything other than it's going to cause the whole hash to crank out a different value. And it's really a little bit like a random number generator. In fact, it's often used for hashes like that until you happen to get lucky and you get the right number of zeros at the beginning. And then you yell, bingo, and everybody else is trying to mine it, takes a look at it, and they go, yep, you got it. Let's go on to the next block. And so that's kind of how the mining works. So the first transaction that was special so the Genesis block, which is the very, very beginning, for Bitcoin it was January 3rd, 2009, you really can't spend it. But over time, what happened is the first block, they said, we're going to adjust the difficulty to take about 10 minutes of trying these different random hashes on a Pentium computer. Well, it was 2009, all right. So fine, you crank it away after about 10 minutes, and you happen to stumble across the right solution. You go, bingo. Well, guess what? In early 2009, no one else is playing the game. You're just sitting there all alone in a gigantic auditorium yelling bingo every 10 minutes. All right. Well, what does that mean? You get 50 more Bitcoin, and then 50 more, and 50 more, which is why we're talking about some of the original founders of the Bitcoin have amassed this pretty big stash. After a while, someone says, what are you doing? I'm mining Bitcoin. How's it work? Well, you just compute this until you, whoever gets it first. So you try it, and all of a sudden, you get a bingo. Well, I got a bingo. As you have more people playing, the algorithm self-adjusts. It says, oh, wait a minute, we only had one CPU playing, now we got five. So we're gonna make it five times as hard to keep it at the 10 minute interval. And now when you have hundreds, thousands, millions of CPUs and beyond working, the algorithm gets harder and harder and harder. Well, also what they're doing is they're dropping the feedback after four years, you don't get 50, you got 25. And then in July 2016, went down again to 12.5. And I had some guys who had done a lot of Bitcoin mining said, what are you going to do? It's going to be worth half as much. Oh no, the price will double. Well, that's kind of wishful thinking. Why should it double? Well, because then we'll lose money otherwise. <laughs> Where's Tinkerbell when we need her, right? I believe, I believe, I believe. And yet it kind of did that, right? Because there's still a lot of this artificiality going on in these things like that. So what's happening is over time, that mining fee is actually going to drop to zero. Not in our lifetimes, it goes to the year 2140. But transaction fees have started kicking in. Basically, you got to go ahead and tip the miner. To make sure that you can go ahead and fit all the stuff in there, the idea of a hash, which is, they say, 256 bits, would do, I can't reverse engineer a hash. I can't say, these 256 bits, I can somehow inflate them with water, and they become the million bit input, but I can take another copy of that same million bit input, recompute the hash, and say, yep, they're good. 
Well, if a hash is so difficult to change, 2 to the 56, 256 is a big number, all right, uh, why not take a hash of a hash? Well, if I take two hashes and hash them together, well, that hash still represents two different values, which if I, I could redo it and hash the hash the hash. And so Ralph Merkel came up with that, and that's a Merkle tree. And so all we do is we just go ahead and we look for any time you happen to see that address and check, 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 check. They all look pretty good. So for security, though, what we find is that when you do these transactions in, you got to spend whatever's in your wallet. Wait a minute, that's not fair. I mean, if I've got 20 Bitcoin and I want to buy something for one Bitcoin, I got to put all 20 in? Yeah, and then you get 19 back and change. Well, wait a minute, can't I just put one in? No, why not? Because the way it's set up is it's set up kind of like, well, what we have with currency. If I have a $20 bill and I want to buy something for a dollar, I can't tear off a corner of the $20 bill and give it to the clerk. I enter the $20 bill, I get back 19 bucks and change, and that's exactly how Bitcoin works. Now, the cool thing is about Bitcoin is that although there's an address associated with you, and therefore you might be able to trace it, there's nothing that says the outbound address has to be the same as the inbound. In fact, most configurations, that's not the case. So what happens? Every single time your identity changes. Think of the serial number on your dollar bill as being the thing that identifies it as you. When I cash in that $20 bill and I get my change back, they're going to be different serial numbers. And if I get somebody else and spend it, get change back, it's going to be different serial numbers again, making it difficult, not impossible, to track transactions as they go through there. And for those who really want to see a math problem, there we go. This is the, uh, the gambler's ruin problem, which basically is stated this way. You go to Vegas and you determine, I have to win. So I'll go play a 50-50 game. Bet a dollar. I lost. Okay, I'm down a buck. So next thing, I'll bet two. If I win... I make two, I lost, I'm up one. But if I lose again, I'm now down three. So I'll bet four, then eight, then 16, 32, 64, 120. You keep going. Eventually, on the do theory, you're due for a win, right? That's kind of how we used to root for the Buffalo Bills. But <laughs> what, what also comes out of that is you might run out of money before you run out of bad, of bad luck. So I remember at DEF CON several years ago, sitting there with a buddy of mine, we're over at the Rio, and we looked over, there is 12 reds in a row on the roulette table. All right, so my buddy, Dot Zero, he has an interesting betting thing. He'll bet one bet a year, $1,000 on red or black. That's it. He just, he just says, it kind of, just kind of grounds me. And the hotel thinks that this guy's a big roller who keeps forgetting to use his card. So they cop him rooms, they cop him drinks, they cop him everything, right? And the odds of him getting his money back every year is about 50-50, so he, he kind of breaks even. Well, we saw 11 or 12, yeah, 12 reds in a row, so we go over there to the table, so we've got to play this. Okay, come on, G-Mark. So he puts out 1000 bucks. My other buddy puts down $500, and like, I got degrees in math and business. It's like, I'll buy stock in the casino, but all right, I'll play, I'll put $100 in. I mean, for me, it's not that I'm cheap, but I don't, I don't get addicted to the gambling. It doesn't work for me. So guess what we all bet on? We're, we're hackers. We all bet black. Yeah. yeah. Guess what came up? Black, yeah. <laughs> We hit him up, and we went back to the bar and drank beers. We had $1,600 worth of beer to drink. But that's the idea. It worked, it worked pretty well. So what's the magic of this blockchain thing? Now this ledger is peer-to-peer. -peer. Nobody owns it. Nobody's in control of it. I don't have to trust my bank. I don't have to trust the government. I can trust my own copy. And because of that bingo function that's involved, when new transactions come into the next block, you can independently verify that the block, in fact, has met the requirements. Compute your own hash using who, whatever nonce this person happened to come up with. They got lucky they happened to pick one. Yep, it works, it works, and then you can trace it all the way back. So when you actually download the blockchain, you're actually revalidating every transaction going back to January of 09. And you got it all. Now, somebody recently said, did you know there's child pornography in the blockchain? Well, there's a lot of things in the blockchain, but it's not like a picture like that, but people have put WikiLeaks in there. Um, Dan Kaminsky put an ASCII art of Len Sassman in there after he died, just to say, hey, here's a little stuff. And then just for fun, he put an ASCII art of Bert Bernanke. He said, wouldn't it be kind of cool to have the Fed chairman in the blockchain? Uh, you can put anything you want in there. It doesn't mean it's easy to get out. But that was kind of a big thing several weeks ago. But yeah, uh, once you get it in there, it's in there. It doesn't change. And that's the problem is that, as yes, we're going to talk in a couple minutes about other uses for the blockchain, like using it for smart contracts. For all of us who've ever written a program, did you ever write code and it ran, and then a while later you realize there's a bug in it? Um, yeah. What if you can't pull the bugs out? It's like firmware. It's like putting a satellite up on orbit. All of a sudden it gets up there and you go, um, Guys, uh, we kind of screwed up a little bit on the measurements on this Hubble telescope. We were using metric instead of uh, 
English units and we got to go up and put a pair of glasses on it. All right. Sometimes you can go ahead and recover it. Other times you can't. You eliminate the idea of a prior trusted relationships. And now I don't have to know anybody in advance. You and I could be strangers. We could trade on the blockchain and it's going to be relatively fast and pretty much high degree of settlement costs. And we co reduce the cost. So I've had a chance to travel a lot of parts of the world. I was over in Doha, which is in Qatar, which is in the Middle East. For those who aren't good at um, geography, it's you know, kind of a little thing jutting out there in the Arabian Gulf and have all their money based upon gas. Not oil, but gas. They get a lot of gas reserves. Quarter million citizens, 1.5 million expatriates come in from all around the Indian Ocean Rim to come work there. People from the Philippines, people from uh, Bangladesh, from you, know, and you name the country, it's out there. And it's interesting, everybody has their own style. I mean, you take taxi drivers, you gotta get paid nothing, right? You get to go cross town that's like a dollar fifty fare. So I, they don't get too many Americans, it's kind of a novelty, so I give them a decent tip. Not a stupid tip to make it look weird, but on a dollar fifty tip, I'll give them three bucks for a total fare. Like, whoa, this guy's nice. Hey, I met an American today. They were actually pretty decent people. You know, we all get to be little, uh, our own diplomats over there. But I talked to him and said, how, how do you get your money back to your family? Why are you here? Because there's no work. And so they send money back home, but they line up on payday to Western Union. And between bad exchange rates and huge transaction fees, it costs them about 9% to move their money back home. It is expensive to be poor. All right, they don't have advantage of some of the things. Imagine if for two cents you could have it to your family in 10 minutes or less. That's a huge, it's a game changer. You can understand why certain banks and certain bank executives have been saying, blockchain's horrible, it's terrible. Why? Because we're going to disintermediate them. All right, they're gone. We don't need them anymore. Yeah, there's always going to be functions for a bank, but this transfer goes away and things like that. So blockchain's really nothing fancy. It's just kind of, well, a bunch of ASCII text. And you have hashes and transaction in, transaction out. You have a little uh, comment field and things like that. Well, that's it. Nothing magic, nothing fancy, nothing compiled in there. It's all just a giant string of data. So here is the first block that was mined after the Genesis block. And what's interesting is that you see January 8, 2009, not see if your eyesight's good enough on the timestamp, but uh, 50 Bitcoins are rewarded. Well, back then, there's only one person mining, Satoshi who set arbitrarily as part of the algorithm that when there's only one person mining Bitcoin, it will take two to the 32nd pot times, roughly 32 zeros out of 256, it's got to begin. Well, if I'm doing a random number function and I'm trying to eventually guess it, statistically I ought to get there about 50% of the way, right? If you pick a number from one to 100, I'm trying to guess it, on average, I'm going to guess it somewhere around the 50th guess. Sometimes I get really lucky, sometimes I'll be really unlucky. And this particular one, with the choice of the nonce was about 2.5 billion, it turned out being about 60% of the way. Now, why would you not make the nonces go all over the place? You really don't have to because, well, this whole thing's like a random number generator, so you just start with one. Well, why is my nonce different from your nonce? Because in my transaction, I propose, I pay myself 50 Bitcoin. Yours, you pay yourself 50 Bitcoin, and those different addresses are enough to cause that my Nonce of two is going to produce a completely different output of your nonce of two. And on it goes and on it goes. So how are we doing today? We're up to block 518,340 as of about three hours ago. Begins with 75 zeros. Two to the 75th power is that humongous number. It's one of the few integers you could write that's actually bigger than the U.S. national debt, at least for now. And... That's a lot of trials. That's a lot of cold air getting turned into warm air thanks to thermodynamics and things like that. And what I think we're going to find out is that historians of the 22nd century will record the true cause of global warming on planet Earth in the early 21st century was the mining of cryptocurrency because this is a spectacular waste of energy. No, it's not waste. It's good. You're creating an energy-based currency. And if you are in the religion of Bitcoin, I don't mean to offend you if you are, but it is a religion. Okay, you believe things to be true, and it's hard to support it with evidence. It's not like I can go into an empirical test and put something in a laboratory and come up with an outcome. It, it's just a belief system, but it's going to work out. And you can see the miner gets the 12.5 because we had double halving and some extra fees. Well, what do you mean the extra fees? Why are the fees coming in there? Back in October, November, December, it got up to 50 bucks to do a Bitcoin transaction. Why? Imagine, because they limited the block size to only one make. So back in the early days, imagine that you had buses that came by every 10 minutes, holds 40 passengers. Well, no big deal. There's nobody or there's one person at the bus stop, then two, then three. Eventually now we got all of us waiting for the same bus. 
Bus pulls up, it's got 40 seats. There's 200 of us. Who's getting on the bus? Somebody looks at the bus driver and said, hey, I'll give you a tip. All right, in you go. And then the next person says, that's how it works. I'll give you a bigger tip because I want to get on there. And pretty soon the block is a little bit like that last helicopter going out of South Vietnam and Saigon in 1975, right? You know, it's like, I got to get on that or we're gone. And so it got really, really expensive, causing internal civil wars and even Bitcoin to do what they call a hard fork and break into two. It became something else. It became Bitcoin Cash. But think about it. 99.9 things are wrong. Okay, there's only one thing that's more wrong than that, and that's me at home. Okay, but you take a look at the carbon footprint of 29 million tons of CO2. You know, I get on an airplane, you go fly British Air, something like that. Would you like to give a carbon offset and put extra money onto your fare to offset your carbon? It's like, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to plant a tree with it? Are you going to go put scrubbers? No, no, it just goes to the bottom line. No. <laughs> But that's a spectacular amount of uh, impact on our environment, and it's only going to continue to keep going up. But man, what a ride last year. It went from around 800 bucks in March to over $19,000 by December. Oh, boy. Now, when I first started looking at Bitcoin, it was $11. But I didn't buy any. When it got to 100 I didn't buy any. When it got to 1000 I didn't buy any. Why? Because I'm studying it. I didn't want to date, I did not want to date the patient because I would all of a sudden drink the Kool-Aid and become part of the religion. Well, you know what? The patient turned out to be pretty hot. I probably should have <laughs> put some moves on early on. So now I got people who, who, who measured their, their wealth, so at least in December, in uh, Lambos, right? You know, one Lamborghini. I said, oh, it's X Bitcoin. And now at that point, you know, 10, 12, 13 Bitcoin, you got a, big, you got a Lamborghini. Back in the day, 12 or 13 Bitcoin might buy you, well, not even a pizza, because some of the first transactions were 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas. Back in 2010, I asked the guy later, he says, how do you feel? He says, well, they're really good pizzas. That's all you can say about it. Keep your saying. But then all of a sudden, oopsies, and uh, dropped pretty quickly, December 17th at $19,800 to uh, late January down at $6,000. And we've been popping around six, seven, eight, seven, six, seven, eight, and things like that. Sorry about the um, wash on the screen. I can't make it any brighter. But then all of a sudden, happy, happy, joy, joy, everything went in the green. Again, bright green for every cryptocurrency you can imagine. Hundreds now of cryptocurrencies, actually kind of measured in the low thousands. Some of them are real, some of them are pump and dump, some of them are great ideas that are going to have a unique way of solving a problem, and other ones are just simply ways that people go ahead and steal your money. They go ahead and they pre-mine, they start making the coins early, and they say, hey, there's only a few of them out there, and they start trying to sell them to you really fast, and by the time you figure it out, they moved on. So there's a lot of concern about that in the United States, these ICOs, initial coin offerings that allow you to get in there. For the most part, you cannot participate as a U.S. citizen. Now, yeah, you go through a VPN and set something up and go through Tor and go buy it someplace else. But the whole idea is more not because the U.S. government's trying to keep you from getting into cryptocurrency. It's because of the spectacular risk that's involved in most of these things lose a ton of money. But in a very thinly traded market, it almost becomes like tulip bulbs, where tulip bulbs do really well until they don't. So I started talking about this uh, four years ago. Uh, currency, been done. Payment infrastructure, done. You can create assets onto the blockchain. Why? I can tag a particular set of Bitcoins and say, hey, my house is associated with this particular address. When I transfer the stuff from me to you, then if you've got that, you can prove to the chain. And I said, here's my contract. OK, you got the house. Now I don't have to go to title recording fees and things like that. Boom, it's all on the blockchain. Uh, Proving yourself as identity. I did an engineering project last year for a company to do blockchain federated multiple countries such that you controlled your information. So if a young lady wants to walk into a bar and a creepy looking bouncer, hey, let me see your license. Well, what do you have to do? You got to show them not only your birth date, but where you live and your address and your full name and things like that. And you don't need to do all that. You just need a binary. Am I 21? Yes or no. If you had something in a trusted blockchain, not a distributed thing like Bitcoin, but what they call a permissioned blockchain where only certain trusted entities can write to it. Now you just got to come up here with your smartphone and said, see the app? I can cryptographically talk to your little app checker. Bing! It says I'm 21. You don't know anything more about me. You don't have to because you're in. So these are things you can start to do that you could not do otherwise. And now we're getting into things like smart contracts where we actually write a little bit of software, and I'll show you how that works. Patent applications have been going nuts. 
And now the patent trolls, of course, are going to roll in. I'm sorry, the intellectual property holding companies. <clears throat> Pe people who do not invent anything, you just buy a patent, and they go ahead and they beat people over the head with them and try to exercise them. By the way, huge victory against those folks in the U.S. Supreme Court a little over a year ago because they used to go venue shopping. Guess where the most popular place was to sue people if you wanted to go ahead and accuse some company of infringing on your patent? Eastern District of Texas. For whatever reason, they always seem to size statistically a lot more. In fact, more patent infringement cases were filed in the Eastern District of Texas than New York and New Jersey combined. It's like, really? Yep, because for whatever reason, yeah, we're going to side with the plaintiff. Well, you can't venue shop anymore. I went to uh, Supreme Court and said, hey, that's not what the law is about. You're not going to go sue a company in the state in which they're incorporated. So buy real estate in Delaware, right? Because most of us have com Delaware companies. But these things are going nuts. AT&T, a Bitcoin-powered subscriber server, okay? Now, it's interesting. You've got to be careful because as you go ahead and look at some of these patents, they're in patentees. I've done some expert witness work. I've had to read these things and explain you know, them. Translate them to 12 people who weren't clever enough to get out of jury duty, and they got to understand these concepts. But uh, the decentralized secure home subscriber uses the blockchain. Can advantage can be taken of the plethora of nodes contributing to maintaining security? What the heck does that mean? I don't know, but they're trying to write patents to say, well, we thought of it first, okay? Um, Bank of America has got a lot of them. Track signatures, physical attributes, or locations of the user are identified. Well, I know that my banking application, was, uh, I got to turn on now. They did a mod a few, about a year ago saying I had to turn on the geographic. It has to know where it is to make sure not in Romania or something like that. But um, in any particular case, the good news about that mm -hmm. is, is that it can then validate, okay, yeah, you're in the U.S., you're in front of an ATM, you're at a bank, you're at home. We're cool. We'll let it go through. But now we want to go ahead and start validating information, stick it up on the blockchain. You can prove that it's intact, that it's the thing. I can now go ahead and have a transaction payment system. Yeah, we talked about it, but they published the patent. Why? Because they got there first. You write it broadly and things like that. Well, that's not anything new. That was in part of the original paper. Yeah, well, go ahead, and we got more lawyers than you. Let's go fight it out in court. And that's usually how these things work out, is that the people who make the most money are the lawyers, right? I recommend people stay out of court unless you're getting paid by the hour. Because otherwise, statistically, it's never going to end well for you. All these things you can do. AT&T, a cryptocurrency car payments. Now, what happens if you don't go ahead and uh, keep your park car payments up? All of a sudden, the blockchain disables your car. All right. Chris Miller, Charlie Balasek, their little thing that they did a couple of years ago with the Jeeps is going to look like nothing, okay? But all of a sudden, we find out is that currency value is credited for a purchase price of goods or services. Maybe you can drive around and, I don't know, do ads for AT&T, and then they put extra Bitcoin in you because you drove past a certain things. When you go ahead and you have these cars that say, hey, put advertising on the side, and we'll pay you for it. How do we know you used to leave it in your garage for a month? Well, you've got to be able to prove and demonstrate like an Uber-like thing that you can prove it, and now you've got hard-coded records that show exactly where you were. Accenture comes up with an editable blockchain. It's like, wait a minute. The whole idea of a blockchain is it's not editable. Well, yeah, we know, but we were late to the game, so we had to patent something. So we patented what nobody else was patenting. All right? It's like washable, indelible ink. Let's patent that. Because look at all the bad things that are out there. Well, that's the whole idea of a blockchain, is you want to go ahead and create a permanent record of things. Now, if you have a problem with what's in there, then go ahead and encrypt every single value that's in there, and then it's key management, and we're back to game one. You know, if we can manage our keys correctly, you throw away and burn the keys, no one's going to ever get the stuff back out of there. You screw up your keys, well, you're screwed up no matter what you use. You see, the big problem is a lot of companies are going, blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. And you go back to them, and the consultant, you say, could I replace the word blockchain with database and achieve the same business outcome? If the answer is yes, kick them out. they got to have a really valid thing here. Banking, wow, you can do online banking with cryptocurrency. I think the biggest achievement, in my opinion, is getting a two-letter domain. <laughs> We're actually one letter, one number, because they're worth less. But they're still, still pretty good. Okay, a distributed ledger uh, platform. Coinbase, this is one of the things that you can use here in the United States. You can validate into Coinbase. They have the Know Your Customer and the anti-money laundering, the KYC AML, if you ever see those initials, that's what they mean. Why? To make sure that you know, get in there and say, well, I don't want to have to pay taxes, it's my Bitcoin. Well, the more anonymous the service is, the more likely it is to get hacked because, well, they're not going to be accountable. Think like Mt. Gox in Japan and some of the other ones that get whacked. So many of these companies, yeah, they'll collect your social security number, date of birth, and things like that, but it's just like opening up a bank account. But you never go broke paying taxes on profits. Problem was, a lot of people are getting tapped because, what, 2015, 38 people claimed 
Bitcoin profits on their taxes. So Uncle Sam's trying to find some way to do this, but the hard part is, is that it's still a work in progress. So I'm not a tax accountant and a lawyer, and I don't play one on TV, so I can't really give you advice. Uh, but if you want to do something more with your life than you're doing now, I would suggest very carefully playing this by the rules. Cybersecurity, you can hang upside down for Brock's on a, bit, on a blockchain. <sighs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm making a little bit of fun of some of these guys, because I went through and I found all these different companies that are, uh, it's a blockchain technology provides massive scale data authentication without reliance on certified trust authorities. Okay. And, uh, and this is going to improve our lives how. Um, this is interesting for people who kind of fake their educational academia and certs and things like that, or they're not easily checked. And sometimes people don't really care. Remember when they go ahead and the Equifax hack and things like that, and they pulled the CISO's credentials, and whether was, what was her undergraduate degree in? Music. Now, before anybody giggles about that, if you do a lot of crypto work, music is right up there because the same thing that makes you think well in the musical world is going to work really well in the crypto world. My grandmother is a music teacher. She taught for 74 years, okay, into her 90s. And I, as a kid, hated taking piano lessons, but it causes things in your brain to align and organize stuff like that. So that really was such a bad fit, but it didn't play well in the press because people don't see that. Voting, wow, follow my vote. Go ahead and Russians, go ahead, go ahead and tamper with our blockchain now. Hell, try to change our blockchain, okay, and see if we can do that. The problem is, is that a lot of times you go, what happens when you get full transparency in government? I don't know of any politician who wants full transparency in government, particularly when it talks about where the money goes and things like that. You can't keep your slush funds going and things like that. You gotta account for everything. So you're gonna have some really good ideas that we as citizens have to push for because governments are gonna say, but we're gonna lose all that fun that we could do otherwise with the loose bookkeeping. Car leasing and sales, you can do DocuSign. Okay, I get that, I've done DocuSign things before, but now we're gonna stick in the blockchain. Why does it have to be in a blockchain? Well, we can prove the ownership. Yeah, but 50 years from now, nobody cares what car I bought, okay? So as a result, gimmicky, yeah, maybe. Deploy a long-range wireless network anywhere. A giant filament at the end of a drone connected to a blockchain, bouncing off of a railroad. <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. How about this one? Augur combines the magic of prediction markets with the power of a decentralized network to create a stunningly accurate forecasting tool and the chance for real money trading profits. Now, I don't know about you, but if I built something that works like magic that guarantees me a profit, why the hell would I tell anybody else about it, okay? <laughs> I'd be just using there to suck all the money out of the exchanges, okay? So again, a little bit of skepticism on my part on this one. You can go ahead and do that for music and entertainment. And yes, I know my internet connection isn't working. I know better. I'm in a hacker conference. The, um, this is actually starting to make a little bit of sense because you heard some of this stuff that came out. Kodak, back in January, did what? They announced they're going to go ahead with the Kodak coin. And their stock literally doubled in one day. Kodak, the folks who invented digital photography and then turned their backs on it, figuring they'd make all their money selling, well, yeah, silver nitrate. <laughs> didn't work too well for them. But everybody loved that. So again, huge hype cycle. Hype's 1999, technology's 1992. Think.com. Ride sharing on the blockchain. Okay, your Uber alternative has arrived. And um, I'm not sure. Stock trading, okay, maybe distributed ledger for capital markets. This makes a little bit more sense now because you're going to have certain requirements that have to be kept for long, long, long periods of time. And if you have unalterable financial records and things such as that, that's going to meet some of the requirements of Graham Leach Bliley and um, Sarbanes-Oxley and anything else that Congress wants to throw at it, we might be able to then demonstrate some semi-permanent records that can't be altered. It's a lot harder to cook the books, and therefore maybe your trades and transactions can go there. I buy that. This one, I think you're onto something. I don't know what their business model is, but if you ever bought a house, you got to do two things that I think are parasitic. Actually, there's a lot of things that are parasitic, but these industries have grown up. Think of going ahead and getting a title search. And then you got to get title insurance. What's a title search? Somebody just goes to the county records and they add up and says, add up all of the liens, add up all the lien satisfactions. If the sum is zero, the property's free and clear. All right, great. So what's a title insurance? It just says if we looked at it and we forgot to write it down, then we'll cover it. But if we didn't see it, we didn't look at it, it wasn't there, we don't cover it. Well, what use is it? Well, it's 80% of it goes as a commission to the real estate agent who did the deal. But you got to have it because the banks insist that you have a title search. And you got to have the title insurance. I've never known anybody ever to collect on a title insurance policy. I don't think it's possible, okay, because of the way they've written the exclusions into it. But imagine this. Now, counties and some of us started doing this. 
you move all your records into a permissioned blockchain. That is, only the county clerk can add to it. You and I cannot. Now I want to buy a house from you. We go to set up an electronic contract. You put in your deed, I'll put in the money in the cryptocurrency. And the contract is a piece of software. It says, at the time of the block that this executes, if the sum of liens is equal to the sum of lien satisfactions for this, not Bitcoin address, but this property address, and the property is free and clear, do the transfer. Otherwise, don't. So now somebody, two seconds before the thing, slams in a little last-second mechanics lien trying to screw things up. The software catches it because it's all part of the same block. It looks around and says, oop, somebody just poisoned the pot. No deal. When that's cleared up, you run it, it works, and then two seconds later, someone tries to do a fast one. The system rejects it. Hey, you can't go ahead and put a lien on this property because the person you're leaning against no longer owns it. We have made Uber look like Boy Scouts because there's still taxis out there. The entire industry, title search, the entire industry of title insurance, zero, gone, nada. All right, they're with buggy whip manufacturers and things like that. And so what we find is that we can really have things that do fundamentally change the way we do business. And a lot of that is getting rid of non-value-added or low-value-added intermediaries in a lot of transactions. Insurance, for example. I'm not sure how much insurance he's got, but he probably could use some. Are you coming back for us, right? You know, can you hear me now? But help companies trust the millions of processes that connect our world. It's proof of process technology. Now, how do you prove it with a blockchain? I don't know, maybe you meet a certain amount of inspection requirements and things such as that. People are trying. Some of these are good. Healthcare, you can go ahead. The enterprise blockchain company. Mm, not getting it. Supply chain management, huge, huge opportunity here. You think about things, that you go ahead and you pack up stuff, for example, down in the Maquiladori plant down in Mexico. And you're going to drive it north across the border, and then you're going to take it up here to the United States. Well, perfect world, what happens? It's manufactured with certain standards, it's inspected, it's put in the back of the cup. There's a whole sheaf of paperwork that goes in there for customs brokerage. Pull up to the border, wait in line, wait in line, wait in line, wait in line. They take a look at it, inspect it, take a look at the box, and you go, off you go. Imagine then if you could seal this thing, RFID tag on there, tamper-proof, tamper-resistant, Tough to make things tamper-proof, just go to the DEF CON. But enough that we meet the criteria, and it's all been locked down because the inspectors there made a permission blockchain entry on that. Now, drive across the border 55 miles an hour. We're going to make it go very quickly because we already know exactly what's in there. If somebody tries to go ahead and make something fall off the back of a truck, because that's how you go ahead and steal stuff, all of a sudden, your manifests are not going to match because you can't cheat them because it's locked into a cryptographic blockchain. And all of a sudden, your leakage, if you will, or um, what do they call it in retail uh, when you have the shrinkage, <laughs> euphemism for theft, pretty much goes away because it's all highly detectable now and things such as that. So that I get. Cloud storage, encrypted cloud storage. When you put something on the internet and you want it to be there forever and ever and ever and never be, you know, I don't know. I don't like that necessarily idea, but there are some things you want to keep forever. All right? But... If you screw it up, they're going to be there forever, and good luck trying to destroy or hide or obfuscate evidence, and so we have to think carefully. But this might work. Energy management. Here's an interesting idea. So what happens when you're on this energy grid? By the way, in the United States of America, let's disregard Alaska and Hawaii for a moment. So the 48 states here on the continent, which is the one state that's not connected to the others for the grid? The great state of Texas. Yeah, they're on their own private grid. And you know, seriously, because of all the energy that's generated in Texas, Something goes really bad, like a uh, Chinese or a Russian cyber attack, well, you know, at least lights will be on in Texas. So what happens if you're in some little regional area and you're generating electricity? I am from Buffalo, so you've got Niagara Falls and all the hydroelectric plant, but what do you do if you're generating electricity and you have nowhere for it to go because it's 2 in the morning and nobody's using it? Well, you just kind of ground it out into the ground because you can't get rid of it. You can't just like put this you know, capacitor of the size of Rhode Island somewhere out in the middle of the desert, and hopefully you know, we'll pull it down someday. So a lot of times you generate stuff. So some people said, hey, why not take that excess capacity and just use it to mine cryptocurrency? Not what they're doing in China, which is the primary purpose for that energy, but use it as a way to create some energy coin that's being able to trade back and forth. But again, Tinkerbell, I have to believe it's real. All right, because the fact is it just represented the fact this is stuff you would have thrown away anyway. So you're basically recycling your energy garbage and creating something of value. Maybe it'll work. Sports management, maybe you can do some uh, bet the Jetcoin Institute. I didn't quite figure this one out yet, so I haven't spent a lot of time working on it. Uh, gift cards. I have done a lot of work with credit card fraud prevention and found out that um, about the $16 billion in annual card fraud that we get, the best way to launder your credit card theft is to go buy a gift card. 
They're small, they're portable, they're easy to sell. You can sell them online with just a number and things such as that. And a lot of these gift exchanges have just a handful of suppliers. <laughs> That's organized crime's way of fronting it through a normal place. It's a way of laundering the cash. Because once you buy a gift card, it breaks the chain from the entire credit card database and they don't jump over. And you can't go back to the gift card company a couple weeks later and say, hey, you know, the guy who bought that thing from you two weeks ago that we approved the transaction, turned out it was a stolen credit card. Can we have the money back? It's like, no, because we've already issued the gift card and it's already gone off to the store. So I will see what happens because you want to transfer these things along. But yeah, there is a secondary market for this stuff. Bit fury. Again, imagine that your entire government records could be available, unalterable, available for public inspection. As a citizen, I'd love this. I think as a politician, you'd be, you know, this would be the worst possible nightmare, okay? We would only be able to get Jimmy Stewart to come represent us in Congress in the future because you'd have to have absolutely honest people going forward, and they're kind of hard to find. Uh, gun tracking, all right. I, you know, I don't know. I still haven't gone through all the changes they did in the laws in Florida, but I know when I got my permit down there, one of the things that was in the law, in the Florida law, I had to read it, it says no state agency shall ever create a database of any firearm owned by any citizen of the state of Florida. I mean, that's right there in the code. And so they may or may not have changed that, but the whole idea is in some other municipalities, some other states, some other parts of the world, having exact tracking is useful. And you know, short of somebody filing off the serial numbers, you lose something, something gets stolen, it's a good chance you get it back. But you know, it depends on how that's set up. We've got to see how these things do. Some parts of the world will love us, some will not. Uh, wills and inheritances, yeah, where's Uncle Charlie's will? I'm sure he was going to leave me something. He was going to leave me that old Corvette. He told me so. And all these times when I was a kid, I've known friends who had people where the wills, they just can't be found. They go into probate, and then they, they get whittled away by the, the state in terms of all these lawyers they put on there. Not a bad idea to go ahead and put some of these documents that should have some permanence up there in a place where they will be permanent. Buy and sell freely. Open bazaar. Okay, I kind of get that, but uh, buying and selling with... Cryptocurrency, Overstock.com, one of the first companies, major companies, to take Bitcoin four years ago. And uh, turned out to be, well, not a whole lot of their transaction volume. They thought they'd have more people, but what was the problem? People didn't want to spend their Bitcoin today. Why? Because it's going to be worth more tomorrow. All right? And so I would do these talks going back to 2014. Who here has got, like, Bitcoin today? Right? Who here will sell me your Bitcoin right now? We'll look it up at the price in Coinbase. I'll buy it right now. Can I buy it? Why not? It's a it's fair deal. It's not worth it. It's okay. But you can go back and buy it back in 20 minutes from now, right? The, tran the transaction. But no, because why? We, we think it's going to be worth more. Okay. If it were a thing like, hey, I've got, anybody got a copy of the uh, TurboTax for 2017? Yeah, it's April 15th. How much is that software going to be worth in about 48 hours? Good luck trying to sell it. Okay. So now you've got a wasting asset. You do whatever you could to unload it for as little price as you can. So psychologically, our future expectation, what's going to happen, and one of the big problems of cryptocurrencies for buying and selling is that people don't yet think of it as a currency because it doesn't transfer freely. Because if I said, hey, will you give me all your Bitcoin for a fair amount of money? The answer is no. But if I said I have a dollar bill to somebody of four quarters, yes, because we see that as a fair and even trade, and it's a stable trade. So when we get to the point where these cryptocurrencies become stable, we can do these things. Also, you go ahead and look at charities. You find out a huge amount of money going to charity gets absorbed in administrative fees. Imagine if you get rid of a lot of that money transfer and things like that. Not so sure. I haven't had a chance to pull through that. But imagine that if you can make sure that more of your money went to the people who really needed it, not the people running the infrastructure or doing the marketing and things such as that. A lot of times when I contribute, I want to contribute anonymously. Why? Because I get on a mailing list. They spend more money on the mailing list than I gave them in the first place trying to get me to give more money. It's like, no, this is free. Take it. Okay? Be interesting to see what happens now with the new tax law for 2018 going forward when your standard deduction is now huge and keeping track of your charitable donations may not put you over that limit into itemization. Um, I don't know if that's going to affect charities or not, but if there's things you believe in that you're helping people out in, don't be driven by the taxes, be driven by the fact you're doing good for people. Law enforcement, trying to go ahead and find the blockchain. I've been advised companies, venture capital firms. We went to mention this company. They said, we can track a blockchain and a Bitcoin, and we can figure out who owned it and things like that. I said, great. Go ahead and tell me how well you're doing with the mixer. Uh, well, we're working on that. Basically, a mixer, imagine that one of us is a bank robber, and they got a whole pocket full of marked currency. All the serial numbers are in order, and they all marked. So if somebody gets caught with 100 of these $1 bills in their pocket, you're the bank thief. 
but we all agreed to go ahead and put all our money in the middle, mix it all around, and take out exactly the right amount of money that we had, but different bills. Now, statistically, that's spread around 90 some odd people. Yeah, someone's gonna probably get two of them, a lot of us are gonna get zero, many will get one. Now, who's the bad guy? Lather, rinse, repeat. And so that's the nature, is that every Bitcoin comes with it a little ledger of every place it's ever been. But the problem is, is that more and more things like Monero, for example, and uh, the currency, and they just did a four to one uh, fork just a couple of days ago on Monero, split into different uh, currencies. It's getting harder and harder and harder to go ahead and figure out what's going on. Uh, human resources, blockchain revolution for the recruitment industry. I'm not quite sure how you buy and recruit a blockchain with human resources, but there may be some value in that in creating permanent records that are not alterable. Corporate governance. Value without borders or intermediaries. Again, being able to have information out there that doesn't require a trusted third party to do the storage. Credit histories, like we haven't learned our lesson yet about problems with credit bureaus. Let's go ahead and put it on a blockchain. And besides, has anybody ever had their credit history have an error in it or something wrong with it? Yeah, and you gotta go ahead and fight with them to go ahead and take this thing off. What if, how you get out of the blockchain? You can't, wait, there's an Accenture patent for how to go ahead and have a uh, erasable, indelible blockchain. Maybe we go ahead and use that. 3D printing. Go ahead and you create something, you put it up there, and no one can take it out of the blockchain. Eh, whatever. Crowdfunding. All right, so maybe we got uh, things. This I actually had to work with a company out in Hollywood that they're going ahead and creating blockchain to go ahead and do things such as crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and things for new movies. All the movies that you get to see in the movie theater, if you're a movie goer, who picks the movies that go into the movie theater? Somebody else does. In fact, there's only like about two dozen people that are actually kind of like the solely rotating ceiling fan the cigar smoke. The idea was, is let's go ahead and let other people vote for it. You get some cryptocurrency, you stake it, you don't pay it, you stake it onto different things. You can tell where the real winners are based upon crowdsourcing it. If it really works, what happens is when some studio funds it, everybody who staked it gets back your stake plus a little extra. So you get paid bonuses to make bets on winners. And the more winners that you back, the more likely you are to be the person who's picking the right movies. Those are the ones they're gonna make. They're gonna have fewer duds, they'll make more money. Everybody's happy, aloha. So tons of uh, references for this stuff and things like that. I want to save a couple minutes for questions because we're down to the last four minutes here. Uh, but thoughts or ideas on uh, this? And yeah, I'll give you copies of slides. I've already sent them all the way up to um, the folks here at CarolinaCon. The only difference with my deck and the stuff that's there is I updated today those blockchain sh uh, shots of what's actually taking place in Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Otherwise, everything else is still current and things like that. Thoughts, questions, ideas, feedback? Number one, number two. Uh, very well on Bitcoin itself or Bitcoin Cash or anything else. Actual, actual Bitcoin. The transaction fees have gone way down. In fact, the mempool, which is all the leftover stuff, kind of got scavenged because when they did the, the split to Bitcoin Cash, it was like a civil war. So now you can stick stuff up in there, but you don't have to put the whole thing in the blockchain. Just put the just put the hash. Say, hey, I got a one billion characters of stuff, and here's the 256-bit hash. So if I ever have to produce it again, I don't need to store it on the blockchain. I just need to store the hash to prove that on this date and this time this thing actually existed. There's my patent proof, things like that. And then it'd be trivial. Just move yourself a dollar from your left pocket to the right pocket, it cost you a buck. Right, the tokenization, in fact, really, when you look at these initial coin offerings or ICOs, they're really creating very special purpose coins that are in a way like frequent flyer miles. Well, what's going on with one of these ICOs? They're basically saying, we're gonna start a new airline, we're gonna not fund it by going to Wall Street, we're gonna allow you to go ahead and fund it, and we'll let you buy frequent flyer miles early on. And with it, you can buy peanuts all the way up to first class seats. Enough people chip in and buy the frequent flyer miles at a deep discount, because we're starting out, what happens? The airline gets funded, the plane goes off in the air, and off you go, and you got a new Southwest. So that's the whole idea. If it's a legitimate idea, is you use that for exactly that. But the concern is there's been a lot of pump and dump and some potential frauds out there. And that's why in the United States, participating directly in these initial coin offerings is not technically legal. You can buy the stuff on the secondary market once it hits the secondary. Yeah, those are crypto miners that are illegal, but I understand what you're saying, but the, his question was, what about transaction fees, and can you have people process a transaction on their own device without knowing about it? Actually, what's happening, you look at Bitcoin Cash, you can move $10,000 for a penny. 
that, you can move 100,000 bucks for about one to two cents. That's enough of a discount that I'm okay with that. Try to go ahead and transfer money to somebody else using ACH or using a, a credit card, line of credit, or things like that. This is like nothing. One minute, time for one more. Can it help musicians and content authors? Yes, in a way that you can prove ownership and you can then go ahead if you're able to create certain hashes and then prove that this is my material, you're infringing on it. The problem with the hashes, though, they're absolute. And so all someone has to do is, like, it's like the problem with fighting child pornography. Someone goes ahead and tweaks a little bit here or there and it's not a hard match anymore. So you need kind of soft uh, matching um, hashes and there's some technology, again, come up with an idea prove the business case, get people to fund it. 90% of them are gonna fall by the wayside, but you might be one of the 10% who really adds value, and in five or 10 years, we'll say, hey, we knew you back when you were just one of us. Last one. one more. Yes, sir. Yeah. What's, what's been the experience of uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies and economies like uh, Venezuela, where they stand? Oh yeah, I mentioned that. Okay, so blockchain and cryptocurrencies in countries like Venezuela. So what happened is Venezuela back in uh, February, they, they announced the Petro, Coin, which is basically going to be based on, based on Venezuelan oil. So we got all these oil reserves. Their economy is a mess. Their, their currency is worth next to nothing. People have to trade at the border and things like that. You're not even allowed to carry some money out of the border. And it's really kind of oppressive for the people in there, but it's not to the point where we're going to launch a couple of JDAMs on them, all right? It's not like a military thing. Well, what's happened then is they said, hey, we're going to do this cryptocurrency, and now we'll, you can pay your taxes with it if you're a Venezuelan citizen. Uh, it's fungible within the country. The problem is when they did this, they said, hey, it's going to be a 40% discount. 50, you know, they offered this huge thing at a discount. To my knowledge, nobody I knew of bought any of it. But that would have been a huge public relations failure. So they say, oh yes, we got all these investors in there, got all this money and things like that, but every single copy of the blockchain was run by the government. It's like, that's the whole purpose is other people can run their own blockchain and inspect it themselves. So what it does offer a value though, the best thing they can do is dollarization. It's what Ecuador did several years ago. Uh, and uh, they just throw away their currency and start pegging it to the US dollar. Okay, yeah, maybe we suck, but we suck less uh, than a lot of other countries and that will stabilize their country right there. It costs the president of Ecuador his job, but it saved his country. And I don't see right now the leadership in Venezuela being willing to commit, you know, sacrifice themselves politically for the good of their people. But something like that could really, really help. Okay, I'm out of time for that. If I'm allowed, do I want me to run right into the crypto puzzle thing? Or do we want to do something else?